and he writes, it is one of the most elegant remains of antiquity. In Roman times, it was like proper mental. Just as much a city for the dead as it was a city for the living. The twin Greek gods, Castor and Pollux. A natural artwork created by the geology. Did the blood have collected into there? So, good morning. Today I'm going to give you uh, quite a detailed tour of all the main sort of historical uh, points about Petra, how it became such an important regional city and why it's such a spectacular place. So join me as we travel through history. <laughs> so the Seek, which is the canyon that leads to the city of Petra, is 1.2 kilometers long. So it takes about 20 or 30 minutes to get there. But before you even enter it, there are already signs of Nabataean tombs uh, dotted around. So it's quite exciting because it starts to give you just a little bit of flavor for sort of spectacle ahead. It's a build up, isn't it? It's a bit of a build up, yeah. And Petra isn't just the monument of the treasury, which you would have seen in movies like Indiana Jones. It's actually a whole city with dozens of various different monuments and archaeological sites uh, that remain uh, in very good condition that you can see today. So the area in and around Petra has been inhabited uh, for as long as 7,000 years, largely due to a natural spring uh, in what is otherwise a desolate desert area. But it's really the Nabataeans in the 4th century who turned it into the colossal city um, that it became. The Nabataeans were among several Bedouin tribes that roamed the Arabian desert looking for pasture and water. But over time, they began using the incense trade routes to establish a trading hub. And in doing so, they became immensely wealthy. So fortified by these towering walls and fed by a perennial stream, Petra was very well situated to control the commercial routes like Gaza to the west, Damascus to the north, the Red Sea and Aqaba to the south, and of course Persia to the east. Previously, it was known to its inhabitants, the Nabataeans, as Rakmu, but eventually the Romans came and took over and the name was changed to Petra. Whilst the city flourished for a while, Ultimately, it was the very things that made Petra successful that actually hindered the Romans. It was remote, the terrain was difficult. And so once the Romans built roads and new trade routes, ultimately Petra slowly became obsolete until it became completely abandoned and was basically lost to the, to the large part of the world. People forgot about it. Now comes a bit of an exciting story. Johann Ludwig Burkhardt was a Swiss man who had travelled to uh, England, to Cambridge University, to learn Arabic. He was a bit of an eccentric fellow as well. He would wear a turban, he would dress as an Arab, much to the amusement you know, of all the kind of other students there, his peers. He was tasked by a group of uh, English uh, elite, a, a group of upper class, to essentially explore the area of Timbuktu. These elite used to uh, essentially fund uh, expeditions and, and explorations. On his journey, uh, Burkhardt heard the story uh, of a dead city that supposedly held the tomb of the prophet Aaron, who was the brother of Moses. And he obsessed uh, about finding it. Um, and then in 1812, he took a quite dangerous inland route uh, right in the middle of the baking Arabian summer. Now, he can't be certain if Burkhardt's disguise fooled the Arabs, his disguise of dressing up as one of them and only speaking in Arabic. He thought he was in quite a lot of danger. He was worried that his very interest in Petra and finding this lost city was going to sort of arouse suspicion from the locals. And just as we're doing now, Burkhardt describes moving through a winding, gloomy, almost subterranean passage. And I'll read you what he writes as he sees the mausoleum. The situation and beauty of it are calculated to make an extraordinary impression upon the traveler. Burkhardt was the first European in perhaps a thousand years to rediscover 
this lost city. And this is the spot where you start to look through the cracks and you see peeking through the two sides of the cliff, the treasury. And this, my friends, is exactly the same sort of experience that Burkhart would have experienced back in 1812. And he writes, it is one of the most elegant remains of antiquity. And it's thought to be the mausoleum of a Nabataean king, Aretas IV. So it's about 2,000 years old. It was built at a time when the Nabataeans were flourishing in the first century AD. And their population was peaking at about 20,000 people. And it was built using iron pickaxes and chisels. And what gives it a really uniquely human element are these little marks that you'll see around the outside. And that's actually where they constructed the scaffolding that would slot into the cliff. The name al Khazne in Arabic uh, means treasury. And it comes from a legend regarding the stone urn right at the top. It was said the pharaoh and some of his armies escaped the closing of the Red Sea. And they created the al Khazne by magic as a place to store his treasures before they continued their pursuit of Moses. And so it became called the treasure of the pharaoh. And you can see at the top, the urn is really quite badly damaged. And of course it's solid sandstone. And that's because Bedouins were taking shots at it, shooting at it, and there are actually bullet holes um, in the urn, and there are bullet holes all over the treasury um, from them trying to kind of dislodge uh, the treasure from the treasury. Petra is known primarily for its Hellenistic architecture, which is a, a style between 323 BCE and 30 BCE, a Greek style. And in some ways it's not really a surprise because the Nebataeans traded with a lot of cultures that were influenced by the Greeks. And so it's not surprising that you actually see references uh, to the architecture to the architecture um, of Alexandria uh, within the structure. And you have to excuse me, that is actually the sound of a donkey going off. And there are also camels right over here. So I'm trying to do a good job of this and give you all the facts, but there's quite a lot of distractions around. <laughs> the structure marries the Nebataeans' own culture of stone carving with this Hellenistic style uh, of Greece. And it's interesting because the Greeks weren't known for stone carving. They obviously built their temples out of blocks of stone, they were constructed. So it's kind of a unique take on Hellenistic styling. Now let's go through this Hellenistic style on the facade of the treasury. Near the bottom of the treasury are the twin gods, the twin Greek gods, Castor and Pollux. Uh, they're often portrayed on horses and you can still just about see uh, the horses there. And, and they are the gods who protect travelers on their journeys. And you can kind of see the relevance of that um, for Petra, you know, given it's, you know, kind of a trading hub. At the top of the treasury, there are two victories seen standing on each side uh, of a female figure. And those are Isis and Tyche, um, being the Egyptian goddesses of good fortune. Again, you can kind of see the relevance of this kind of, uh, of choosing these goddesses. Um, and then at the very top, you can't really see it anymore, um, but there would have been four eagles. They were there to carry away the soul because, of course, ultimately, this is a mausoleum, it's a tomb. And now, the most interesting part, I think, are these figures here. They are two Amazons, i.e. female warriors. And I think this little bit right here is the actual axe um, she is holding over her head. So really powerful imagery there. Amazons are mythical female warriors and hunters who surpassed some men in terms of their physical strength and also in terms of their combat skills. I think it actually really tells you something about Nabataean values. The fact that they're displayed up there alongside goddesses as well. It goes to show you uh, how much esteem um, the Nabataeans held women in. Queens were shown alongside kings on coins too. And one Egyptian politician, <laughs> one Egyptian politician, I have to show you the camel. Anyway, as I was saying, yeah, queens were shown alongside kings on coins too. And one Egyptian politician named Zenon wrote in Papyrus in 259 BC that he'd heard of these two um, 
chariot drivers uh, being arrested for trafficking slave girls. Uh, it's quite difficult to do when there's a I'm camera. I'm not sure if I can use it. No, 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 because it's keep going. Because I don't know <laughs> and they were held in jail for seven days. This might be because um, the Nabataean sensibilities were offended by the treatment of these slave girls. So I think in some respects, it certainly sounds like the Nabataeans were quite ahead of their time in terms of the perception they had about women and the role that they played in society. Similar to Michelangelo's David cut in marble, this was cut from a one piece of sandstone, essentially, one cliff. And so you couldn't make any mistakes. If you made any mistakes, they were permanent. They would be held in the stone for the rest of time. So I think it just goes to show what an enormous difficult task it was to get it right the first time, like as they did. And I just thought I'd add, you can't really see it now because it's not too busy. It's only about uh, 8 o'clock here and we got here, you know, 6.30 in the morning. So there aren't too many crowds, but the humidity from the crowds is actually enough to damage the dry sandstone. And on top of that, they found white spots on certain monuments where it comes from steric acid um, from people's hands resting uh, on the walls. The treasury surface itself has reduced 40 millimetres in the last 10 years from people just sort of leaning against it and touching it with their hands. Just the sheer number of people, I think I can't remember quite, but I believe I read somewhere that it was as many as a million people a year uh, visit the treasury. Um, that actually has an effect on it. Uh, you know, that giant piece of rock is impacted by the enormous crowds that come passing through. Although they wrote in a sort of late Aramaic, and many of them were uh, literate, they didn't record their history, they didn't write it down. Um, and so they're kind of shrouded in mystery a little bit, the Nabataeans, in that respect. We get most of it, oh, a lot of our information from other, uh, I guess, empires of the time, like, for example, the Greeks. And what that means is the Nabataeans sort of kind of disappear and reappear um, throughout this sort of historical record. And it really sort of shrouds them uh, in this kind of mystique first century uh, Greek writer and geographer Strabo. He says that many of the fruits uh, were the same as you would have got uh, presum presumably in the Mediterranean, but instead of olive oil, um, they used sesame oil. The Arabian um, sun made it very hot uh, to kind of make fires. So you would expect to see lots of kind of fires in the mornings as people um, you know, baked their bread for the day but a lack of horses. They didn't have horses. Instead, they, were, they um, depended almost entirely on camels to fulfill the same kind of function uh, as horses. Wow. Which is interesting because now this place uh, is full of uh, donkeys. Strabo was also hugely struck by their lack of slaves. Um, the kings and elites at banquets and feasts would, would either uh, serve themselves um, or they would uh, serve each other and the idea of not having say, slaves and serving yourself in Roman times was like proper mental so <laughs> they were a little bit um, again I don't know it's interesting we say already hopefully you're getting a kind of feel for these Nabataeans and their, their perhaps their sort of views on women and, and now as well sort of a um, you know they don't they didn't have any slaves so you know, perhaps they were a little bit ahead of their times in, cer in certain ways um, anyway so now we're approaching uh, the theatre. This theatre is built in, again, a sort of copying uh, of the sort of Greek uh, and Roman style of theatre. Unlike being constructed from the ground up, you know, block by block, again it's uniquely Nabataean because it's carved into the rock face. It could hold about 3,000 um, people, but then once the Romans um, later took control of Petra, it expanded up to eight and a half thousand people. And that would have been about 30% of Petra's whole population. 
is it was purposely positioned to bring into view the highest number of tombs. So it would give you that kind of spectacular view over the tombs. So I've jumped up here. I'm not 100% certain I'm supposed to be up here. The curtain was stored underneath the theatre and there would have been a slot where it would be pulled up and pulled down uh, in front of the theatre and there would have been a store, store area under there and the actresses and actors would have come through some of these passageways. And it was poetry readings and dramas and also there were gladiator um, you know, fights here or whatever you would call them. Um, but no one became famous from those gladiator fights um, because of the high mortality rate. And I'm not certain if those gladiator fights were purely a Roman thing or whether that was also a Nabataean thing. There are thousands of tombs across Petra and each of these would be dedicated to a family. So the Nabataeans would pay to be buried uh, within one of these cities. And there were several uh, holy Nabataean cities of which uh, Petra was one. And you have to remember that they were still largely a nomadic people made up of tribes. And so they would visit Petra, um, you know, for feasts and to trade. But largely, you know, Petra was, in a sense, just as much a city for the dead as it was a city for the living. And you would have these, uh, these tombs right next to, um, I suppose, the living areas of the city. I mean, we are essentially coming into the center of Petra city, and all the tombs are here. The idea is that the dead are being honored by the living. So that's why they're kind of in close proximity to the living. So now we're gonna walk up to the royal tombs. There's a guy on a donkey over here. And he's like blaring out his music. I just missed it on film as he like went up the steps. I was like, he's the equivalent of like, Jordanian equivalent of like one of those guys in a BMW, drives around town blaring his music. Quite funny. Ah, and here we are. You'll notice um, these tombs, the facades, faces of these tombs have been worn away. Um, and if you look at Petra, not Petra, oh, I made the mistake, Petra's a city, not a monument. If you look at the treasury, you'll see that it's sunk into the cliff. It's in a frame. Um, and what that means is when it rains, the water runs off down the cliff and falls around Petra, around the treasury. Whereas this is not so well protected from the elements. Um, and there's some other interesting things about this as well, which is that it's only partly carved from the stone. So the first two levels are carved from the stone, but the upper level that's fallen away over time is actually constructed. And that's actually quite unique uh, for a Nabataean tomb. This royal tomb is called the Palace Tomb, and it's speculated to be the tomb where the kings of Nabatea were buried. But it's not the name the palace tomb is in reference to the fact that it looks like uh, a Roman palace and it was uh, ornately uh, decorated on the outside. It was not uh, in any way uh, an actual palace. And it contains four burial rooms that we'll go and have a look at. So I'm in the central tomb as it were and I believe that these are the individual uh, graves. Oh, that must have been a bit short of these Nabataeans. And this is now the Corinthian uh, tomb and you can actually see some Jordanian blokes having a little nap in there. Hello, Salam. There are four water basins outside the front of the Corinthian tomb and these were used in cleansing rituals 
so this would have been one. Now it's used to store water bottles. <laughs> this tomb over here, you can see, again, this is just right next to the Corinthian tomb that we just saw. It has a donkey in it, and they absolutely honk. They, they stink inside. So they were very uh, protective of the tombs, and of course, the contents within. And in the uh, 20th century, unfortunately, a lot of the uh, artifacts were stolen from the tombs. But it's interesting to see that they now have these donkeys in there and these um, Jordanian guys just having a nap when a lot of the tombs had like serious warnings of being you know, cursed by the gods if you sort of interfered with them. <laughs> but uh, I don't know what the rules are about having a nap in them. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Dushara wouldn't have been too happy if uh, you put a donkey in there and it was shitting everywhere, but you know, what do I know? So here we are outside the silk tomb. <laughs> and this one's beautiful because you can see all those natural rock formations. So this is sort of the last main royal tomb. Uh, and this is the urn tomb. And this one was actually turned into a church uh, after the expansion of Christianity in uh, 446 uh, AD. So it has, I think the expansion is, if I had to guess, the uh, uh, the block type construction here. So here we have it, the urn tomb. Again, one of the more impressive ones when you look at how far it was hewn, hew, hewn, hewn into the rock. And the sun's really started to move now, so we're seeing these hugely impressive views. And you can see over there, the theatre, and now you can kind of understand what I mean by, you know, it kind of having that spectacular view by bringing into view the greatest number of uh, tombs, and in particular, these royal tombs. But let's go and have a look inside. And it is just enormous in here. I'd say it's easily the size of a couple tennis courts. The rock above, they're almost like, you know, natural works of art carved into the stone. And in some respects, they kind of remind you, I've been to, you know, Venice and various different Renaissance places across Europe. And it's interesting that even in this tomb, uh, you, you find yourself looking up at the ceiling but not for artwork made with paint and brushes, but a natural artwork created by the geology, but nonetheless, you know, enormously impressive as well. I mean, when you consider that someone did this by hand with an iron pickaxe uh, <laughs> into stone, I mean, it's remarkable. One of the things you can see are these holes in the side and presumably again that would have been the result of where they placed the scaffolding in order to slowly chip away at the rock. Incredible. And, and the Nabataeans held their stonemasons in very high regard um, and there's evidence of that because on these tombs you often see they've actually had their names, the names of the stonemasons carved into them. One thing that's kind of immediately obvious when you're walking around the center of uh, Petra is the natural fortification that we talked about and how that sort of offered them uh, real kind of defensive, um, you know, advantages. And oh, you've got these cliffs there, then you've got the cliffs on the other side, and then again, you've got the cliffs around the other side. You're like in a clearing surrounded by, you know, some cliffs that are, you know, a couple hundred meters high. So you can see why they must have felt like, you know, very uh, secure in their little oasis in the desert. It's just so typical Jordanian this is, you're walking around one of the world's most fa famous historical sites and there are still just, you know, goats grazing everywhere. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about it, to be honest. I guess on the one hand, it's like, maybe it's quite, uh, historically accurate, there probably would have been a lot of goats around being sold and whatnot, but on the other hand, these are 
some of humanity's finest works of cultural heritage. So, mm, I don't know. So here we are now uh, coming down towards the center of the town. And on the right here, on this side, were a lot of the uh, you know, houses that were built um, during the Roman times. And then on the left over here, and we're going to go have a greater look, is a lot of the sort of the public um, buildings. On the far side, uh, about half an hour uh, walk uphill, um, is the monastery. It's larger than the treasury, but not nearly as ornate. So we just had a little break in this cafe here, looking over the view. And you can see over there those royal tombs. And yes, we had a little coffee, an Arabic coffee, which of course has cardamom in it, which gives it a very, very uh, Middle Eastern feel. So as I mentioned earlier, the, Nab the Nabataeans came from uh, tribes of Bedouin who would essentially roam the land with their cattle, with their goats, with their sheep, looking for pasture and water. And there were trade routes passing through their territory. And so initially, they actually acted like bandits. And they quickly realized that they could, there was money to be made if instead they charged a fee uh, to offer protection. It was only a matter of time before the, ne the, the Nebateans started to actually coordinate the trade caravans themselves. And that was big business. And they started to make an enormous amount of money, uh, which in turn led to the development of the city of Petra. So at the height of Nabataean power, passing through Petra, you would find textiles from Syria, uh, bitumen from the Dead Sea, you'd find ivory and sugar from Africa, frankincense and myrrh and spices from India, and perhaps even tin from Afghanistan. So it became a real trading hub full of different products being sold. And the Nabataeans taxed this heavily, so business was booming. Another Jordanian version of a guy in his beamer. It won't be any surprise that they were particularly adept um, when it came to harvesting rainwater. It was their ability to control the water supply that in many respects led to the rise of the city. Earlier we talked about that natural spring, which meant that you know people have lived here for 7,000 years ago. Well, you know, that spring could only support so many people. Not only did they have these sort of ceramic pipes that led water down, uh, not only did they dam valleys and force the water to, to go in certain directions, but they also did things like they used stucco to line natural depressions. So you remember earlier I said that the sandstone kind of slowly releases water over time. Well, it's kind of a blessing and a curse because yeah, it stored water and slowly released it into the streams, but if there was a sudden downpour, you know, that water would only sit in those natural depressions in the land for so long before it was absorbed by uh, the stone. And so they would line those depressions with um, that stucco to keep it there and even kind of cover it as well. And obviously having water like that was big business because, you know, you have to understand that trading caravans were sometimes hundreds of camels and hundreds of people. And they would arrive um, across the desert, um, you know, from areas like the Wadi Rum, which we'll be walking across soon, you know, thirsty. And so it was also a business opportunity for them. They could, you know, sell water back to these people as they traveled through the city. And this expert control of water led to this. They were able to use it for luxury purposes here at the Petra Garden and Pool Complex, which is the name of a series of structures in the center of Petra. Um, and it's basically uh, an elaborate garden with pool structures and even an island pavilion in the middle of them. They were so good at gathering water and so good at storing it and had such complex water management infrastructure. When the Romans took over, and of course the Romans are famous for being you know, some of the first to do things like create underfloor heating and uh, sewage systems, etc. When they arrived here, it was so good in fact that they didn't even adjust it. They didn't do much more to it. 
Um, but yeah, they got so good at managing their water that they would grow lavish, um, exotic plants. And even the villas that the Nabataeans lived in all had, um, you know, elaborate gardens. And as you walked down the streets that we we're just walking down there, those streets would have been lined with, you know, palms. And so it really did become an oasis of plant life um, in the center of an otherwise, you know, really arid landscape. Uh, and it's just a tribute to, you know, the enormous ingenuity um, and skill that the Nabataeans had at conserving water. I don't know if I've already mentioned it, but, you know, it could rain as little as once a year here in the winter. So they really had to make the most of that opportunity. It's incredible. So I'm just walking back towards the uh, Great Temple, which is where, you know, a lot of decisions would be made about, you know, city infrastructure, a lot of business would have taken place couple extra things that I just like kind of forgot to mention. One of them is that this Wadi Musa, um, this sort of perennial stream that has been feeding people um, you know, for 9,000 years, um, is said to be the stream created when Moses you know, struck his staff on the rock when he was leading the Israelites you know, from the Bible, etc. And uh, that's why it's called Wadi Musa. Um, and Wadi Musa is also the town above, whoop, sorry, is also the town above where all the uh, locals, you know, now live. Um, and Wadi Musa, of course, meaning Mo Valley of Moses. Um, the other thing to mention is I got a bit overexcited about all that um, water control and management stuff, but I'm not sure I actually mentioned that one of the things they had was a swimming pool, and in that swimming pool was that uh, island pavilion that I referred to. Oh, this is cool, isn't it? Look at all the, the way it's falling down. It's actually another theatre up here, above the Great Temple, that would have housed about 620 people. God, you've got to watch out where you're going, don't you? Street. That was a staircase that just led to my death. It's interesting to see some of these things um, up close, just the kind of the, just the, just the scale of them. This dog definitely has the right idea. <laughs> I'm gonna give him some space though, because I've got history with these Jordanian dogs. So here we are outside the Kassir Albint, palace of the Pharaoh's daughter. And it comes from a local uh, folk tale uh, about a sort of a wicked Pharaoh who had a daughter and in order to choose the suitor for his daughter, um, he set them the task of delivering a water supply to her palace and both suitors using different water sources delivered water to the palace at the same time. So essentially she chose the suitor that was more modest um, and that was the one who ascribed the success, um, his success to God rather than himself. So that's why it's called the palace of the Pharaoh's daughter. I thought it'd be an appropriate place to discuss the religion of the Nabataeans. So they worshipped um, Arab gods and goddesses. Uh, primarily one of them was called Dushara. And they also worshipped their deified kings. And it's thought that the, what's it called? The, the monastery at the top, thank you, um, was actually dedicated um, to the worship of one of those kings. So Dushara was their main kind of god. And he was basically associated uh, with the sun. A lot of the god and goddesses that are carved into the various structures of Pe Petra are actually um, directed towards the sort of equinox and solstice, sunrises and sunsets. They have these kind of religious associations with the sun and earth. So I'm going to do this bit a little bit quietly because uh, I don't want to get lamped by a Jordanian bloke. 
but Peter um, actually released a video in 2018 of some of these animals um, being abused and they claimed that they were used to carry uh, carry tourists all day which we've already seen and uh, the video actually showed them being beaten and whipped and you know the beatings and whipping uh, got more and more intense um, as the animals sort of you know suffered to uh, you know, do whatever it is they were sort of being beckoned to do and they also uh, showed videos of wounds in some of the animals that were actually infected with uh, and maggots. Perhaps get a picture with a camel but I certainly wouldn't encourage you to ride one. Uh, no thank you. All the way back. Ironic that he has no idea what I'm currently talking about offering me a ride. <laughs> Jordanians did respond to that video that was released and this sort of information about animal abuse and they built a veterinary clinic. Peter has since sort of returned and in 2021 they sort of suggested that things hadn't really improved much. I don't want to get into the middle of a hot debate about this but it certainly seems to us as though conditions for these animals could be a lot better, particularly these donkeys trekking up and down to the monastery, uh, which we saw on the previous video. That was the place that we arrived in, um, the one that's 30 minutes walk up the hill. Uh, I mean, it's just a brutal lifestyle and it's hot and yeah, it's uh, not the prettiest sight in the world. And I am not looking forward to that climb up there. <laughs> I would be fine with it if it wasn't for the fact that I've just walked across the bloody country. I've walked over every bloody hill from here to Umkais on the bloody Syrian border. That's why they added the little. Are you part. coming to the top? No. 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 What, what, what are partners for, eh? You know I've got zip off trousers. Is it time to go aircon mode? Amy thinks that when I take off the bottom of my trousers, and call it aircon mode. It's an ick. She hates it even more when I'm on an airplane and I've got like the zippy Adidas trackies and I like unzip them all the way up. Then I walk around the airport. It goes all the way up to like past it's my knee. Like knee. She doesn't like it. <laughs> this is definitely a bit of a trek. The things I do to bring you, the viewers, excellent content. Walk 472 kilometers, but will I still walk up? I think it's 600 steps. Hell to the years. Oh. The donkey shit up here is ripe. It really, uh, it really, gets into the lungs. Steps are amazing though. These are carved into the rock, so almost certainly original Nabataean. I wonder how many goats came up here, or possibly even humans, for the very last time. You can see Wadi Musa over here, Valley of Moses. Interesting to see the water here. As you mentioned earlier, sandstone is porous, so it should slowly be absorbed into the rock. So perhaps this was also lined with stucco. So here we are at the high place of sacrifice. I just looked it up and it's actually 800 steps. So I'm a bit sweaty now. And one of the common things they would do here is libation libation being a sort of a sacrifice of you know some kind of liquid some kind of drink and it's here on top of Jebel Madba mountain that one of the other common sacrifices that would have taken place would have been of course animal sacrifice sorry ah is it ah thank you ah thank you information good so this is the sacrifice bench. This offering table behind you in the center. Ah, okay. This, offering table. this place where they put the statue of Nebuchadnezzar God Dushara. Dushara, Dushara yeah. the god of the mountain because they chose this mountain because it's very high and close to the heaven. Okay. But this is where they sacrifice animals. Oh,
<laughs> so this is the area here they would have sacrificed the animals, this gentleman's telling me. They collect the blood in this hole. They collect the blood. That time, that time yeah. it was connected. Oh, okay, so it would have been connected. The blood would have co collected into there. This one where they put the water. Yep. To wash their hands, wash animals. Wow. So that's what it's all about. So yeah, this is where they wash their hands. That's the rain tank over there. Yeah, that's to collect the rain water as now. Yeah. They bring the water from the tank to here and they wash animals. They wash yeah, their yeah, hands. yeah, yeah. They wash the area also. There is a drain for water. In the uh, winter time, it's raining. It's raining water, water drain out. Because yeah, this is yeah. for sitting, not for collecting water. Yeah, yeah. So they would all sit around the outside. And then this is the altar here in the that's center. The offering table. Dins, the yeah. drinks, the yeah, food. Yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's that's the top of uh, that's the tomb of Aaron, Moses' brother. Tomb of Aaron up there. Yep, 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 yep. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. We don't know if human sacrifice took place here, but we do know that boys and girls were sacrificed to Al Uzza elsewhere, and that there was a ooh, second century philosopher called Porphyrius, and he reported that about 300 kilometers from here a boy's cut throat would be cut annually. So the Nabataeans did do uh, human sacrifice, but we're not certain if it actually took place specifically here as well. I mean, so far we've had, you know, stories of lost Pharaoh's treasures hidden in urns on top of temples, princesses and, or oh, Pharaoh's daughters rather, and their hand in marriage. And now we have some suspicion, or some reason to believe rather, that human sacrifice actually took place here as well. I mean, you couldn't make it up. It's the most Indiana Jones tourism spot you're ever likely to come across. Awesome. Team Petra now from virtually every angle. We've got the uh, Royal Tunes down there, cafe where me and A went for lunch over there, garden and pool complex down there next to the Great Temple, next to the Alcacer Albint, and then over the top there, we have the monastery. So I think this is a good place to end. And when I was making this video, or putting the notes together for it, what I want to do is give you a sense of what makes this place so magical. And it's really a combination of factors. It's the natural geology of the area that fortified it and protected them from other cultures. It's also that Nabataean uh, ingenuity of being able to turn that natural spring, which originally drew people here 7,000 years ago, into something that could support 20,000 people and also become a source of income. And of course, on top of that, it's its position geographically at the center of so many trade routes. So it was trade, it was the natural rock formations, it was the spring, and it was the ingenuity and engineering of the Nabataeans. And finally, Frederick Edwin Church was a leading American landscape painter. And he visited uh, Petra in 1868 and painted one of his most important works called, unsurprisingly, El Kazne obviously the Arabic word for treasury. He called it El Kazne Petra. And I want to bring you back to the beginning of this video when we were talking about our friend, the Swiss explorer, uh, Burkhardt. And I think that Edwin captures that mystery and you see in his painting that sense of aura to the treasury creates that Burkhardt must have seen when he first discovered Petra after it had been lost to the Western world for so long. In the painting you can see the dark, gloomy passages that Burkhardt describes. You can see the overgrown uh, vegetation and even a small stream flowing through the Seek. Of course, this all gives you that sense of what it must have been like, you know, only I suppose 50 years or so previously when Burkhardt discovered it in 1812. I just want to say thank you very much for watching. Anyone who comes across this video, I'd encourage you to watch our others. And join me now as we walk across the Wadi Rum, the desert. Now though, I need to get down this bloody mountain and I'm not wearing any sun cream. Like and subscribe. Ha ha ha.